So from manage- your experience, they've got a strong management team. Exactly. They've got a strong management team. The CEO I didn't know previously, but he seems switched on as well. And there is a third arm to the business, which is they have a joint venture in Germany, which is concerned with metals recycling and also has a coal pulverization plant. That German joint venture is already producing very good profits, but it could grow further in the future. So those were a couple of individual investments. We didn't actually talk about my investments in investment trusts and investment companies. So there are three that I want to mention. One that I've held almost from the time that I started full-time investing and has been one of my most successful investments over that period and is still one of my largest investments. Hello and welcome to the Fund Your Retirement podcast. A guest-led podcast aimed at sharing insights and strategies to help you build long-term wealth. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Mark Bentley. Mark has been a full-time stock investor since 2004, having pursued investment as a rewarding hobby for the 20 years previous. Mark now sits on the board of directors of ShareSock, a not-for-profit organisation that's dedicated to the support of individual investors and shareholder rights. Some of the standout topics were Mark sharing in detail some of his best investments and how he came across them some of his worst investments and what he learned from them, two stocks he has high hopes for currently and the reasons why, why 60% of his portfolio consists of investment companies, and his 18-month foray into trading and what he learned from that experience. This episode could have easily been two hours long. Mark was a fantastic guest sharing some great insights from his multi-decade experience as a private investor. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and let us know in the comments below. Let's get started. Hello, Mark. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, Lee. Uh, Thanks very much for inviting me on. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this one. How did you get started on your investing journey? Now, how has that evolved over the many years you've been investing? Well, it was quite a long time ago now. really goes back to the early 80s when I was in my first job in the IT business working for Logica. And at that time, I used to study the weekend FT quite avidly, particularly following John Lee's and some of the other columnists they had. My investing style was very influenced by his philosophy. And, and I feel it's an enormous privilege that he's now lordly patron of the organization that I volunteer for, ShareSock. Yeah which we'll talk about later. It's extraordinary how that life develops. And I was never expecting to actually meet him in the the flesh and work with him on some matters. That's brilliant. What a great story. The very person you followed and perhaps had a a big influence on you. Yeah, Yeah, you're now working alongside him in in Shetstock. Oh, fantastic. So how has your journey evolved from those days? Yeah, sure. Often based on companies that he or or colleagues had suggested, I I looked into them, considered what he was saying about them and made small investments. Those went pretty well. As you may know, he generally favours a value-ish style and is very keen on on family firms. I mean, one of the, the beauties of family firms, unlike larger corporations where the CEO is just someone you hire, doesn't really have a direct personal interest. Family firms often have big share interests in them. So they're very well aligned with other shareholders and tend to be prudent because obviously they want to protect the legacy of the family. In a number of cases, that's proven for good investments. You know, we're talking back in the 80s, that was before AIM existed. There was something called the unlisted securities market was the predecessor of AIM. So that was the early stages. I started and ran my own business between 1987 and 2000. And then a few years after that, in 2004, I decided to become a full-time investor. So that was quite a big jump. Having done it as a hobby for approaching 20 years in the early days, I thought this investing lark's going pretty pretty well. I'm sure I can do even better trading, gearing up and so on. I concluded after about 18 months, I'd made it made some good profits early on, gave a chunk of it back and ended up with, a, with over that 18 month period with a very small profit, which really wasn't worth the amount of effort I was putting in it. And also one of the problems with trading as opposed to investing is you're really tied to a screen, just wasn't for me and that I was better off taking the sort of slow and steady route of 
focusing more on, on longer term investments and meeting companies. It was also around that time that I got involved with Motley Fool. I can't remember the exact history of how I got there, but I got back into what was called Pawnee Pilots Pub, which mm. was a bulletin board run by Paul Scott. Besides Paul, quite a number of, of leading investors, one of whom was known as Carmen's fella, was David Streder. Okay, from Sharesock yeah. as well. We'll we'll come on to that. Of but, course, but yeah. He had quite a significance in my investing career as well, because I never thought I could approach CEOs of companies and get to speak to them and so on. And he really encouraged me, said, you're a shareholder. <laughs> You're a part owner of the company. They, sh they should answer your calls. And lo and behold, he was right. That led me more to digging deeper into the companies that I was interested in investing in, speaking to the managements, attending AGMs and so on, which as we'll discuss a little later, I've certainly found valuable. So David had quite a big influence on my investing style as well. And again, it's a pleasure to be continuing to work with him with ShareSock. It's really interesting how you come across these people who have had such significant mm. influences in your investing yes. style or approach. It's a Newton story. We build on the shoulders of giants that yeah. everyone has previous influences and it makes the whole experience more pleasurable that you're not just investing yourself. You know, David describes it as it, it could be a team game and work together, bounce ideas off each other, which say we're going to come on to ShareSock and Signet, but that's one of the things that, that Share and Signet offers is the opportunity to meet with other investors, discuss your ideas with them and get feedback, which is very valuable. What type of investor would you say you are? I describe myself as a valuation based investor. It really goes back to the John Lee days, which was very much part of his philosophy. What I mean by valuation based investor, I don't invest for value or for growth. I could be investing in either of those, but I'm looking to buy things at good prices mm -hmm. where you've got a good risk reward. So even though a company might be very good, I don't like to overpay for it on very high multiples. I'm just certainly happy to pay more for a company that has good Good growth prospects. The big risk with buying things that are on high multiples, you can get hit by a double whammy. If they disappoint at any point, then first of all, the forecast earnings can fall, which directly impacts the share price. But in addition, the multiple that they're trading on can fall. You get double effect on the share price if they disappoint and you can get a very big fall, which is a sort of vicious circle, whereas you can get a virtuous circle in the other direction. So if you buy a company that's lowly rated, but has good prospects, then you can both get a re-rating and as its earnings grow, you get further increase in, in the share price as well. As I say, I, I like to buy things that I think offer good value and have an asymmetric risk reward where you've ideally got some margin of safety and have good upside prospects if the firm delivers and manages to grow. It could be a recovery situation where the company's temporarily going through a tough patch but has a good prospects for recovering from. Have you got any examples of companies that fit that profile and worked out better than you expected? And have you got any companies that fit that profile at the moment that, you, that you've got a high conviction on? Let's take those one at a time. I've given some thought to some of the uh, ones that have worked out over time. My largest single stock is a, a name listed company called Renew Holdings. If you look at it, it's done okay, but you wouldn't have expected that it would have made an investor a huge amount of money. It's a very long story about this. And as I mentioned, I think patience was part of my strength or a bit of an edge. And this was an illustration of that. Plus the valuation philosophy. I can't remember the year that I first got it into Renew. I think it was something like 2000. It would have been before the financial crisis. So probably around 2006, 2007, when it was trading at about a pound. It was, a, at that time, it was a construction firm, not a, not a house builder as such, a firm that offered building services. It was one of those cases, again, where I met with the management, went to the AGM. That revealed very valuable information. And also another benefit of attending the AGMs, personally at least, is, I hate to admit this, but it's probably only when I've got an AGM lined up that I read an annual report from cover to cover. I want to prepare for the AGM and see what questions I might have. If you do that, if you put in the work to really read through an annual report, you'll often find interesting things that you didn't know about the company, which can be very useful. The interesting thing about Renew was that construction business was very low margin. It had about a 2% margin. And certainly nowadays, I really, I don't like 
construction companies because first of all you have the low margin and then also there are risks that projects go wrong and then they lose money on them so they tend to be very unreliable but Renew's management were smart and they reached similar conclusions to me that this sort of construction business wasn't great and had all these flaws so they decided strategically to move the direction of the company from the original construction business to what they called specialist engineering which was offering services in a number of specialist areas, for example, water, the rail industry, nuclear industry as well, nuclear decommissioning and such. And these are all industries where you need a license to operate, where Joe Bloggs can't just turn up yeah. and do something, where you've got to get licensed. They changed that direction through a series of acquisitions. So they, they bought other companies to move them from being a low margin construction firm to ultimately, which they are today, it's still not very high margin, but it's quite a respectable margin for the type of business, which is clearly a much more attractive investment. Now, the key to this one and why it made me so much money was the financial crisis. As I said, when I first invested from memory, I think it was about a pound. And during the financial crisis, the shares in common with many others really started tanking. Before it, I didn't have a very large holding in the firm. It didn't bother me too much. I didn't do much about it. We were getting to the depths of sort of 2008, end of 2008, 2009. And as I say, the shares are down to about 25p, 30p or so. And then they put out a trading update. I remember this very well. And the trading update was quite positive. Because everyone was worried. I think they had a certain amount of debt, you know, were they going to go bust, which is why the share price was so depressed. It was clear from that trading update that they weren't, that things were going to be okay. Strangely, though, the market didn't react. So I saw that as an opportunity and I was able to buy a good number of shares. It wasn't a huge holding because I still felt there were risks in there. But initially, I think at around the sort of mid highish 20p levels and 28p, something like that. Gradually, the market started to react. They started to move up. I think there were then interim results or results which, which confirmed that the business was improving. So I don't think I sold any at that point, even though the shares had gained significantly from that low. You might want to have a look at what the share price is today. It's about eight quid. <laughs> now wow. I have, so I'm no longer invested in it at all anymore. Yeah. I think it's in the last few years, it hasn't been very exciting. So I got out a few years ago, but it, it was something like a 30 bagger from where I bought it to where I ultimately Fantastic. sold out or more. And again, it shows the value of focusing on value rather than price yeah. and taking advantage of the price as Graham and Buffett say, you should take advantage of the market. Don't let the market take advantage of you. So that was one example. If we have time, there are actually three others I'd like I to. I think we've got all the time. I think these are great examples. Yeah. Thank you. A common theme with all of these is again, you've got to put the work in to appreciate whether your decisions are right or not. Yeah. Now, the next example also comes from the Motley Fool days. Now, there, there was another very shrewd investor, a very smart guy on, on Motley Fool. He went by the, the pseudonym Usigenia, and he often wrote interesting things on their boards. And he just mentioned casually on one occasion that he'd come across a mining company, which might be worth a look. It was a company called Niger Uranium. And he said what was interesting about it was that they had some mining properties of their own, but they also held shares in another quoted mining company. And the value of the shares that they held, I think, was more than the market cap of Niger Uranium. So I thought, oh, this looks interesting. So I'll look into this a little further. What was this company that they owned, which was more valuable than they were? That, that was another company called Kalahari Minerals. So, okay, next step in the research, let's look into Kalahari Minerals. So what's that all about? And it turned out that was a very similar company to Niger Uranium. It again had some assets of its own, and it also owned shares in another mining company, which were worth pretty much as its market cap. Wow. And that, that company was a company called, it was an Australian company called Extract Resources, which was a uranium mining company. So that was the third stage in the research. Let's look into Extract Resources. Now, nowadays, Extract Resources is probably a company I wouldn't invest in because it's a fairly early stage exploration company. So at each of those stages, you were getting a discount effectively on the Extract shares because, as I said, Kalahari was trading at a discount to the value of its holding in Extract. 
Niger Uranium was trading at a discount to the value of its holding in Kalahari. So you're getting a bit of a discount by investing higher up the chain. But there is also a slight element more risk higher up the chain in that assuming that they eventually realized the value of their holding in the companies that they owned, there was no guarantee that they'd return it to shareholders. They might blow it on something else. So I looked at Extract. It was speculative, but it had a very interesting exploration property. The company had been founded by a geologist who had a theory and the early drilling results of his theory looked very interesting. Now at that time, which again was in the late 2000s, the largest open pit uranium mine in the world was a mine in Namibia, which Rio Tinto owned. No, I've forgotten the name of it, sorry, yeah, so no, I should have looked this up. But anyway, they had this uranium mine, which was essentially a big chunk of a mountain. Now around that mountain was desert. And standard geological techniques at the time didn't have any way of determining what was underneath the sand. This geologist's theory was that the deposit that was in the mountain, which Rio Tinto were mining, actually extended under the desert sands. So he formed this company which started drilling beneath the sand. And lo and behold, they started drilling, they started finding uranium, did more drilling, they found more uranium. In the end, to cut a long story short, it turned out that this deposit under the sand was considerably bigger than the mine that Rio Tinto had. As you can imagine, as this became clear, I bought shares in all of these companies because they all gave me the exposures, not too much, but there was actually a fourth company which wasn't in that chain of three, but also had an investment in extract a company called Polo Resources. Another part of the research, which was key, there were some very tricky characters in the managements of some of those companies. I won't name names there because I don't want to get into any libel suits. Having looked into it, I was satisfied that yeah. if they did well, the other shareholders were likely to do well as well. That worked out fantastically that all of those ended up making a lot of money. The mine that extract discovered got sold to the Chinese in the end. Uh, they didn't get quite as much for it as they would have done, ideally. By the time it got sold, it was just after the, the Fukushima accident in Japan, which oh, caused yeah. the uranium price to tank. But they still got billions for it, which <laughs> translated nice. to, yes, to very good value for the, for the shareholders. And in researching Extract, I made contacts electronically with, with Australian shareholders, because I say it was an Australian company. And I know a number of them, unlike me, did put large chunks of their portfolios into this company and they made fortunes, but yeah. that was the sort of level of risk that I personally wasn't able to make. So I did very nicely out of it, but none of my individual investments made fortunes in themselves because as the share price was going up, I would have been top slicing because there's always a risk it could fall back again, that there are any number of unknown things could cause problems with it. But that did very nicely. Just ask you a quick question there before we, because I know you've got, we've got a third yeah, example, a couple more, couple more examples. You mentioned yeah. that you top slice. Do you have a particular system or strategy of how you go about top slicing? Yeah, sure. It again comes to the high level strategy that, that I aim to have a particular, well, in any, for any given holding, um, I have a broad idea of what percentage of my portfolio I'm happy for it to be. The more confident I am in the stock, the bigger that can be. And the more speculative I think it is, the smaller it would be. If it gets significantly above my quotes comfort level, that's when I would top slice. Okay. So it's based it's, around it's, the size that it becomes a percentage of your portfolio. Yeah. If it's too it's big. It becomes so big that it would cause me to worry if something yeah. were to happen, then I'd yeah. be uncomfortable. Yeah. Third example, then this was an example of meeting management was really valuable. That was an oil company called Encore Oil. I'd been invested in it for some years. Got to know the management very well with natural resource companies. Be very wary of the management. Most of them are very hyperbolic and overstate how wonderful their assets are, how wonderful the resource is. It's a whole other talk, which I'll probably be doing at some point, but about things to watch out for and what they say. That, that they, they embellish yeah. the numbers. Exactly. The something or other gets polished. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Shall we say? laughs> yeah. yeah. This, in this case, the management of Encore were the opposite. They were always extremely cautious. In the case of Encore, it was quite a complicated story. They had a number of successful oil and gas assets, not, nothing spectacular. And, and they also had an interest in a potential gas storage project. So it was a gas field that could be used for gas storage. 
probably seen that's become a topical issue again recently. But what's very clear in hindsight now, actually, the government made a mistake at the time and they didn't back it. The end result was that Encore sold off that, that asset to another company for a relatively low price, much less than we've been hoping for. But at least it brought some cash back into the company and the company was sitting on a bunch of cash and it had one potential oil stroke gas field that, that it wanted to explore. I think it was going to drill a well. And this was where, as I said, people were asking, how good do you think this is going to be? And he said, you just don't know until you drilled it. And the situation with that company, when you looked at its value, it was valued more or less at around the value of the cash. And the key thing from that meeting with the CEO of the company was he said, if this well doesn't succeed, then we're going to return the cash to shareholders. So I spoke earlier about asymmetric risks. That was a real asymmetric risk because if it didn't work out, you weren't going to lose much. You're going to get most of your money back. And if it did, who knows yeah. what it might show up. So the share price had been gyrating a little bit. And because I was so confident in it that there wasn't much risk of losing, when the share price dipped, I was adding bits and pieces. So I built up quite a decent sized holding in it. And we were getting close to the time when we were going to get the results of this drill that they were doing. As you said, there's a bit of luck in, in investing as well. But as I said, I built up a, a bigger than usual position because of my confidence there. And I remember was out one afternoon, I think, attending a different investor presentation of some sort. And I came back that evening and suddenly realized that holding had more than doubled. They discovered what turned out to be something that's now known as the capture gas field, which was a very major gas field. So it went from, I think the last purchase I made was about 16p and it suddenly shot up. It, when I came back that afternoon, it was over 30p. And of course, with the size of the holding having doubled from when it was already reasonably large, I did immediately top slice at that point. I still kept a reasonable size holding because there was a lot more drilling to do to see how big this thing was. And they kept going and a bit like extract, the more they drilled, the more they found. It turned out to be really big. And I remember the share price peaked at about £1.50. 50. Fortunately, I had top sliced a chunk because I think it was because of a change in, in taxation, similar to the windfall tax that got introduced recently. There was another one. The company got bought out for about 75p. So still obviously still a very good. decent return, yeah. but I'm glad that I top sliced at the higher levels yeah. as well. So that sort of shows the value of yeah. that strategy. Yeah, it does. Okay, I'll give you one more. So one, one last one, yep. if, if may, which, which again it illustrates the value of meeting with managements, attending AGMs. And again, it was one that I think it was Tamsin of PI World. She'd arranged a presentation. I think it was cohort, a defense contractor. So I went along, listened to their presentation. Wasn't all that appealing to me, but anyway, went and see them. You've got to kiss a lot of frogs to, to find a <laughs> prince. But by chance, there happened to be a second company that she'd arranged to present there. That was a quite a small company called Keyword Studios, whose share price at the time was something like pound sixty. That company offered services. Uh, at that time, it was principally language translation and functional testing services to the gaming industry, electronic games. And then it looked like quite a nice little company and it's a good market to be in. It had plenty of room to, to grow, picked some shares up. I think it was, as I said, around pound sixty originally. The share price actually then fell back a little bit, but because I quite liked the company, I added a bit more, 140, 150. And then I went to their AGM. Before going to AGMs, I always read the annual reports carefully. And I, I noticed one oddity in, in the annual report. A chief executive, a chap called Andrew Day, had a lot of shares. He had about 10% of the company. And it wasn't clear how he'd acquired those shares. Now, the original founder of the company, an, an Italian guy, I don't remember his name, I my head anyway, he was a non-executive director. And so after the AGM, I, I went across to him and I had a chat with him. And I said, oh, Andrew seems to be doing a good job. And I said, I was just a little curious, how did he get so many shares? Because the founder had more shares. I think he had something like 30 to 40 percent of the company mm -hmm. at the time. But how did the chief exec get so many shares? And the founder explained to me, he'd known Andrew from a long time and he really rated him. So to get him on board as CEO of the company, he'd agreed to give him 10 percent of the company. Okay, yeah. Which was yeah. kind of jaw-dropping. I thought, well, this has got to be some pretty incredible guy to persuade the founder to give him so much of the company. 
Andrew did a fabulous job in that company. It was a buy and build story, acquiring other businesses, because th this gaming services is really a bit of a cottage industry. There are a lot of very small companies doing little bits and pieces. And the idea of keywords was to roll all of these up, which he did very successfully. Part of the secret of the success was when acquiring those other companies, he brought the managements with the company. So it wasn't a case of taking them over, putting in his own management, but he brought the executives along and they felt part of the acquisition was always in shares as well. So they had a stake in the business and it really worked well for both sides. And probably about a couple of years after this, he arranged a capital markets day. And it was very interesting that rather than the CEO doing most of the presentation, he asked many of those founders of the businesses that, that they'd acquired to do their own presentations. And, and I spoke to some of them after that as well. And they said how much they'd enjoyed joining Keywords family. The share price now is nearly 30 quid. <laughs> yeah, it's a two billion pound company now. <laughs> Brilliant. Absolutely so brilliant. It's done fantastically well. And you know, I'd never have invested in it if it weren't uh, having confidence in the in the CEO and Obviously, an incredible really, success story. Attending the AGMs for you has been so important, hasn't yeah, it? Yes. Getting to know the management. Yeah. yeah. It's, it AGMs sounds like it's been crucial. Presentations, yeah. So much great lessons there. And hopefully the audience have Good. really enjoyed those lessons as well. Have you got any companies at the moment that you're looking at? something yeah there, 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 are, there are several actually which i'll mention and, and they're all companies that, that i have shareholdings in so that might be good that might be bad but i don't want to pump anything that's no absolutely do your research first just, uh, yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely yeah. so check them out yourselves very thoroughly so first on my list i've got upgs up global sourcing I think that's a very interesting case. It's another one where I first got to know them by chance. I was hosting a seminar up in Manchester for ShareSock, where they happened to be presenting, similar to some other companies. I quite liked the look of them. I wasn't quite convinced to invest at the time, but I followed them after that. They seemed to be delivering on what it said. I liked what they were doing. Based in Oldham, Manchester, which is a pretty impoverished area, and during the pandemic in particular, they did quite a lot for the local community as well as for the business. They run one of the largest graduate training programs in the Northeast. It's a, again a firm where the management has quite a bit of skin in the game, big shareholdings themselves. There isn't really time for me to go into the details of the business. The listen, any listeners that are interested really need to study it themselves. But I think at the current share price, for me, it's good value. I've been adding to my holding recently, and I think this business has a lot of growth potential and offers a nice dividend as, as well, which I always like. So that's the first First one that I'd mentioned. Another one, in the last year I've moved to the northeast of England, which made it convenient to attend the AGM of this, which is Hargreaves Services, who happens to hold their AGM in Durham, which is quite close to me. Quite handy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as you say, got handy originally came to my attention because it was trading well below asset value again, but it's not a pure asset play. It is a profitable trading business as well. And that's done very well since I bought them originally. I attended their AGM and you'll find a write-up that I wrote of that AGM on ShareSock's website in our AGM reports section. And again, it seems attractive to me at the current share price. What do they do? Several things. I was just talking to some other investing colleagues about that last night. The sort of original core of their business. Originally, going back in the history, their main business was actually coal mining in the UK. Right. So they've been around a while then. <laughs> yeah. They've progressively moved out of that. And now one part of the business is Hargreaves Services, which is logistics and earth moving. They've got a big contract on HS2 now, shifting muck, <laughs> as you might say. So that, that's one part of their business. Again, there isn't time to go into the deals, but there, there, is, there are some interesting prospects in that which suggests that can grow and it looks quite nice. The second part of the business is the lap, Hargreaves land. So they own quite a bit of land, which they develop and sell on to property developers, both commercial and residential developers. Some of it was land that was originally sort of mining land that they had, but they also, and this is what I learned at the AGM, they're also buying land where they see opportunities. I mentioned commercial and residential developers. Also, they've sold some land in Scotland for wind farms and uh, renewable energy projects, which is obviously quite an attractive sector. So they're not building the projects, but rather than selling, actually leasing the land to wind farm developers. So they get a, a, an income stream from oh, that. Over, yeah, over nice, clever. Yeah, it is. They're a very smart business. 
Oh, and an important thing I should mention about that, you'll have gathered my focus on managements. A key attraction for that firm was that I already knew the chairman already, who I knew was a very smart guy because he was the chair of a, another very successful investment of mine, a firm called Aving Trans. That's Roger McDowell is his, his name. We've also Another investor in the firm is, sorry, just trying to, I'm not that good on names, but anyway, a, a recognized shrewd investor is also in there. And funnily enough, you remember I mentioned Renew Holdings, one of my most successful yeah. investments. Their former finance director is now finance director of Hargreaves. It was nice to meet these guys at their AGM yeah. recently. They knew me already from, from previously. Yeah. So from your experience, they've got a strong management team. Exactly. They've got a strong management team. The CEO I didn't know previously, but he seemed switched on as well. And there is a third arm to the business, which is they have a joint venture in Germany, which is concerned with metals recycling and also has a coal pulverization plant. is not time to go into the details. Oh, yeah. That. That's probably another but, podcast. But it's interesting than it sounds. Part of the business potentially. In there that German joint venture is already producing very good profits, but it could grow further in the future. So those were a couple of individual investments. We didn't actually talk about my investments in investment trusts and investment companies, because in many of the asset classes that I mentioned, it's easier to get exposure through investment trusts than individual companies. So there are three that I want to mention. One that I've held almost from the time that I started full-time investing and has been one of my most successful investments over that period and is still one of my largest investments is the TR Property Commercial Property Investment Trust. Mm. They had a terrible year last year. I think one of their worst years ever. The whole sector was hit pretty badly, but they've got a very shrewd investment manager who, who I think really knows what he's doing in that sector. I'm happy to put money with them. A the second one that I'll mention amongst my higher conviction holdings as uh, JP Morgan Growth and Income Trust, which has an investment approach that rather suits me. It's run, as the name suggests, by JP Morgan. It has quite a broad investment mandate, so they can invest pretty much in what they like. And they bill it as they invest in JP Morgan's 50 best ideas around the world. Yeah. And as most people probably know, JP Morgan is not a dumb firm. So I think being invested in their 50 global best ideas is not going to do too badly. Yeah. And also they pay out a dividend, which is 4% of the asset value each year. So they don't specifically buy income producing companies, but you're guaranteed a payout at that level. And because I'm living off the income on my portfolio, having a dividend income is quite important to me because if you don't, then, then to produce your income, you have to sell things and then you might be having to sell something at a, when the market is weak and when you wouldn't really want to have to sell it. So hence dividends are important. And then the final one is a firm called Harbour Vest Global Private Equity, HVPE which again has been a very successful investment for me. I've held it for quite a few years now. It's currently trading at a very big discount, around 50% to its net asset value. And unlike the Candover case, I'm much more confident in the management of that one. So quite optimistic about that going forward. You mentioned that 60% of your portfolio is in these investment trusts. Why is that? As I explained, it gives me exposure to areas that I can't invest in easily myself, where there's more expertise. If we take each of the three that I've mentioned, my direct investments tend to be in UK quoted companies. There are a few exceptions. I have occasionally invested in Canadian ones and yeah. mentioned Extract, which was in Australia, but I tend to stick to the UK market because there's been enough work learning about this market without trying to learn about other global markets. They all have their own nuances. So to get exposure outside the UK, I tend to rely on investment trusts. TR invests across Europe. So it's not just UK properties, but they invest in European ones as well. I mentioned already that the JP Morgan one is global. So they invest across the world, naturally significant exposure to the US. And Harbour Vest similarly is an extremely diverse trust. And obviously the individual investor can't invest directly directly in private companies. So that gets me exposure to an area that I can't invest yeah, in uh, myself sense. direct. Yeah, it makes sense. 
I know that you run quite a diversified portfolio. Now, would you mind sharing why you do run such a diverse portfolio? With yeah, audience? sure. We've spoken about my investment philosophy, basic philosophy. That's distinct from my investing strategy. Now, for any investor, they, they need to tailor their strategy to their personal circumstances and personal strengths and weaknesses. As I mentioned, from 2004, I became a full-time investor, so I wasn't getting any income from any other sources. Hence, capital preservation was very important to me, and I was obviously looking for or trying to build a portfolio that stood a good chance of growing as well and ultimately generating a good income. That led to both a sort of top-down and bottom-up strategy. So from the top-down point of view, to avoid too much risk in any one area, I diversified classify my portfolio into a number of what I'd call asset classes. So asset classes I divided into our fixed income, high yield, real estate, natural resources, and broad international exposure. And then with, within each of those asset classes, I don't want to be invested in just one or two stocks, but at least five or six. So you can see already that leads to some 30 plus yeah. stocks. And in fact, I, I have more than that. So it's probably a bit more than five or six in each of those, more in some categories, fewer in others. But that's what leads to a diverse portfolio and my upper limit on any one stock because I want to be able to sleep at night is about 5% of my portfolio. If I had more than that in one stock and something horrible happened to it, then that would be a very uncomfortable experience. Part of, of my strategy relates to my early experience investing. Early on, after the period I became a full-time investor, you have high conviction holdings and so on. Yeah. And what I found personally, well, I'm not a smart enough investor, <laughs> whatever turned was my highest conviction turned out to be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> That made me very cautious thereafter. Whilst I, I have stocks that, that I obviously think have very good prospects, I'd never bet the house on them. Not that I ever bet the house on it, but that I'm, I'm more cautious now. And that's why I put that 5% limit on any one holding, because you never know something can come out of the blue that you just hadn't forecast. I'm reasonable at researching, but I don't think I'm the best researcher in the world. There are other people like Leon Boris, for example, who I think are fabulous. As I say, you've got to tailor your strategy to your own strengths and weaknesses. And I think one, one of my key strengths is that I'm a very patient investor. So I'm prepared to wait and give a firm a chance to show whether or not they can achieve what they claim they can achieve. But patience is one thing. And also, if I may say this, I think I'm quite robust psychologically, so it doesn't trouble me if the share price of a stock falls for a period. I may well buy more if I still think it's a good company and nothing fundamental has gone wrong with it. I'm not easily shaken out of my holdings, but you've got to be careful because if something goes down, you do need to think, why has it gone down? Have I missed? Some. So it is important to continually update your research and view, not because it's fallen alone, because sometimes a fall is just because it ha there happens to be one large shareholder who for some reason needs to get out or wants mm. to get out. It's good to prompt you to take a second look at it and just double check whether there's anything you've missed or something that's arisen that, that's concerning. It may mean rather than adding to it that you want to reduce your holding in the stock. Having recently read The Art of Execution by Shaw, he makes a very good point in there, which I strongly agree with about not being a rabbit caught in the headlights when some new news about a stock comes out and the market reacts to it. You do need to take firm decision. Has the market overreacted, in which case it should buy more if it's gone down, or has it underreacted, in which case I should be selling? <laughs> yeah. You do take a positive decision. Don't just sit there and do nothing without thinking about it. Do nothing might be the right answer as well, but you, it's a, it needs to be a positive decision, not a default, just ignoring what's happening. In your earlier days, your highest conviction stocks perhaps didn't yes. always work out the way you hoped. That's right. Yeah. Would you mind sharing a couple of stories of those? Because they'd be really interesting for those that yeah. are just getting started. Getting oh, no, on this. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We'd be del delighted to do that. And they can learn from your experiences. So hopefully <laughs> they won't make them mistakes. So I'll give a few illustrations from my earlier days and one slightly more recent one, which I think was 2016, 2017. 
So from the very early days, and this was one of the situations which really convinced me not to get overexposed to any one stock. In the sort of early to mid 2000s, there was quite a craze, or craze is too strong a word, but quite an enthusiasm for online poker, which, which, which I actually got involved with as well. I still enjoy playing poker to this day. <laughs> and there were quite a few online poker firms. And I looked at a, a number of them. Several of them looked pretty good value considering the opportunity. There was always a bit of a threat over the sector. The US had very strict rules, which are now starting to relax a little bit about betting and gaming in general. I think actually there'd been a specific court ruling on poker that because, because it is a sort of combination of luck and skill that it was a skill game and hence didn't didn't fall within the definitions of gambling where there, where there were very severe restrictions been taught quite some time that some legislation might be introduced that could affect particularly the online poker companies but I read quite a lot about it and some supposedly informed views from analysts and they said they thought it was very unlikely that the legislation could be passed and at this particular point, I can't remember the exact date, pretty much day by day was decreasing because Congress was running out of time to, to pass any legislation yeah. that might do it. And then I remember it was on a Friday evening in the UK. It was a bolt out of the blue that was the very last day of Congress. And the news emerged that, and this was under the Bush administration, that the administration has managed to tack some legislation onto a ports bill, something called UIGEA. It was something gaming act. But anyway, so obviously when that news emerged, looked at it very closely and the details of the legislation, and I suddenly realized that several of the investments I was in were liable to be hit pretty hard by this right. severely impact because you probably wouldn't be surprised to know that by far the largest part of the market was in the US. So if they got banned from operating in the US, this would severely hit profits and revenues. Over that weekend, when I realized that, I started looking at my portfolio and to my horror, what I hadn't really looked at before was my total exposure to that amongst the various companies that I'd invested in. It wasn't huge, but it was, I think it was in the 10 to 15% of my portfolio range. Yeah. say far above that 5% level. So it's not just an individual investment, but it's related investments as well could be affected by a single event like this or a factor like this. Now, other examples, completely unrelated examples are things like oil companies, for example, if you have oil companies in your portfolio, then obviously you're aware that they're linked to the oil price. So if the oil price throws a wobbly, that would clearly affect all your investments in area. A lesson I learned from that experience was to make sure that that I was well aware of my total exposure to single events. So that, that was the, the negative of that. And it did cost me a fair bit of money through not expecting that, that event. Yeah. I can't, uh, it would have been very hard to predict. That's the thing with investing. They're costly lessons, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> yes. It's, that's again, coming back why it's so good to learn from other people, because you can try and avoid yeah. some of the expense by, by learning from others and, and also from books. Yeah. Rather than necessarily having to take all the hits yourself. Some things you just don't find in books or not obvious. On, on the positive side of that, as I say, I spent the weekend analyzing it and I looked at the global picture. I looked at the individual investments that I had, made an individual assessment on each of them, how exposed they were to this new legislation. And from my memory, that there were two in particular, which had different exposures. There, there was party poker and there was 888. And the, there was actually a big difference between those two firms. Party poker was very heavily exposed to the US, but 888 had more revenue from Europe. So it was quite clear that party poker would be hit much harder. And I made a judgment on what I felt its share price should be than 888. So Monday came around, the stock market opened, and I was very surprised to see that 888, if anything, was hit harder than party poker. So I promptly sold party poker, and I can't remember, I don't think I was brave enough to add to 888, but I didn't sell that. And it turned out that was exactly right, because within a few, day, few days, party poker 
has started really tanking, whereas 888, I think, did recover a bit. Again, the basic investment philosophy really did work if you did the work, but it was quite a bit of work at the weekend to figure this out. Yeah. So that was the first example of things that I didn't work out and lessons that I learned from it. Other ones from the early days. Now, I mentioned the value of speaking to managements. There's also a danger in that. There, there were a couple of investments in my early days, one called March Hole, another one called Night Hall, where really the, the CEOs of those companies had really talked them up. And they just didn't deliver. So that's something that's really come with experience. I think I've, nowadays I've got a much better nose for what you can and can't trust. You do need to be skeptical and somewhat cynical about what you hear in company presentations. Another lesson, a very specific lesson that I learned in the case of Nighthawk, that, that was an oil company with operations in the US. Before I invested in that one, I did have quite successful investments in, in other oil companies, which were mainly North Sea based. And again, I knew nothing about the sector before I got in contact with other investors that were experts in the sector and in valuing the companies. So it wasn't just North Sea, there were also other offshore operations. But it was mainly focused on how many barrels were in the ground, barrels of oil were in the ground as a means for that. And you tended to value them on, you know, a multiple of how many barrels they had. So something yeah. like a fair value might have been $6 a barrel of reserves that the company had. So that was the figure that I focused on in, in evaluating oil companies. Now this company, Nighthawk, they claimed to have huge numbers of, of barrels with resources rather than reserves. I won't go into the technical details, but the distinction between those. But anyway, they claimed, and it wasn't untrue, that there were huge amounts of oil and gas in the properties that they had uh, licenses for. But what I didn't appreciate at that time, with the offshore-based producers, most of those oil wells tend to produce oil at similar sorts of rates. Not strictly true, but a decent flow rate. And I wasn't aware of the influence of flow rate on value. If you think about it, though, it is actually extremely important. As I discovered with Nighthawk, even though you might have millions of barrels in the ground, if it only comes out at about one barrel a day and it's very difficult to extract, then That's it's not worth a lot. <laughs> so, so that was a, a very specific lesson. Then one more slightly more recent e example, uh, another type of investment that fits into my valuation-based philosophy, specifically what I'd call realization plays. So companies, usually investment companies that are winding up, and sometimes you find that the share price is at a discount to what you expect them to return to shareholders when they wind up. And I had quite a number of successful investments in that theme off the top of my head. I can't identify those, but there, there were a number that had been successful. Yeah. Then I came across an investment company called Candover, which was another one of these. And the shares were trading at a pretty big discount to its NAV, but it was in the process of winding up. So I thought, well, this looks really interesting. I really like this one. And it seemed fine. Now, NAV, I hope listeners would know, is a net asset value, which is the difference between assets and liabilities. What I hadn't fully appreciated in this case was the extent of the debt that the firm had, and specifically the fact that that debt was at very high rates of interest. And as time progressed, it started to become clear the asset values that they described were generally were reasonably reliable for investment companies. They're usually fairly accurate, but they were struggling to, to sell those assets. It was taking a long time. And with debt that would that they had to pay, I think it was something like 14% interest they were having to pay on it. And that was a time of relatively low interest rates. The interest started piling up and very rapidly eroding the value of it. In the end, it realized far less than I'd expected. So I took quite a loss on that one in the end as, as well. The lesson there was if you are looking at those sort of special situations, do look at the liabilities as well as the assets and how those might change over time. Now, these are great lessons, really insightful, because as you already you. pointed out, this is how you learn, isn't it? Learn from other people's mistakes. And by you sharing this, hopefully. If I can help anyone avoid yeah. similar mistakes, that'd be great. Yeah. It can be expensive, can't they? Exactly. <laughs> I, they've cost, certainly cost, all cost me money. Yeah. I say, if I can help anyone to avoid those sort of losses, that, that, that'd be great. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So is it fair to say that share sock is the other passion in your life? <laughs> yeah. I, I think my time is probably 
50-50 divided between looking after my portfolio and the work that I do for ShareSock yeah. and Signet. So when did you join ShareSock then and what drew you to them? So ShareSock was formed in 2011. I mentioned previously David Streder, who was a strong influencer on my investing. Two principal founders were David and another gentleman called Roger Lawson. Roger did a lot of the work in the early days. So they formed it in, I think it was February, 2011. Three months afterwards, David asked me if I would become a non-executive director of ShareSock. And he's a very persuasive <laughs> fellow. And I wanted to give a bit back from my learnings. And I mentioned about some of the rogues that I'd come across in AIM. And I was really frustrated that they seemed to be able to get away with it with no punishment. And I wanted to try and do something about it. ShareSock was an opportunity to give a bit back and to try and improve. It's a very, very difficult battle, but it would improve the regulatory landscape so that crooks can't get away with it. We have a much fairer investment environment. So there are really two strands to that. One, as I say, is improving the regulation, but ShareSock also very much aims to offer educational services for investors to try and help people avoid mistakes in the first place. So it's a combination of trying to provide better information for people and also educate investors to avoid the pitfalls. You have an extensive library of educational content there, don't you? For... We do. For investors that are just starting out we have a series of videos our investing basics if you go to the education section of our website you'll find that there immediately the website by the way is www.sharesock.org you look at education you'll find the investing basics and mentioned earlier in the conversation the network effect as well of being able to network yes. ShareSock has some online forums of its own, but most importantly in the last a couple of years ago we merged with a with another organization called Signet which runs groups across the country. These are groups, they're, they're not investment clubs, so people don't invest together, but in the groups we speak about our investments, sometimes we have external speakers, people make presentations. It's again, highly educational. It's self-help groups. We all learn from each other. I'm pleased to say that to, together with another Share Consignet member, we've set up a new group in my area, which meets in Durham now. Or <laughs> Yeah, we had our second meeting of that Brilliant. group last night, which was very enjoyable. Yeah, good. Sometimes if you're an investor, you might find none of your friends are interested in it, so you've got no one to talk to. More than about. likely. <laughs> the, the Signet groups provide a great way of, yeah. of doing that. So you can join both organizations, get access to all the resources for a combined membership fee of £60, or Signet alone is 25 and ShareSock alone is 45 So yeah. you know, that's these, a year, isn't it? Hard, uh, per annum, yes. Yeah, that's a so year. These, these are, <laughs> yes, that's right. But these are very modest sums, I would hope, relative. Yeah, yeah. It's Those worth mentioning, so, it, it's uh, a not-for-profit as well, isn't it? It's, totally, it, yes, exactly. We're not a commercial organisation. Yeah. The directors are all unpaid volunteers. We do have some paid staff, which is why we do need to have subscriptions. Yeah, brilliant. So ShareSock and Signal has a, a multifaceted approach. It's to improve the regulatory environment for individual investors. It's also mm -hmm. to help educate and create that network effect for private investors to learn and help That's each right. other. Yeah, it's fantastic. I will make sure all the links are in the show notes below, so if anyone wants to visit the ShareSock website, right. Signet, everything will be there. You can learn, sign up and join. Also as well, Mark, would you mind if we shared your Twitter profile in the links below so people can follow you? No, feel free. Uh, ben 100 on Twitter yeah. and ShareSock is ShareSock UK. Yeah, I'll, I'll put that link in the show notes below as Brilliant. well. So Thank you. everything will be there for you to join and learn more from Mark and learn more from ShareSock. So Mark, what a really good podcast that was. Really enjoyed listening oh, thank to the you, stories. Thank you to say so. Brilliant. It's okay. been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Bye for now. Well, that's it from the Fund Your Retirement podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode and the many other interviews from our expert guests. Please subscribe and don't forget to check out our other podcast shows, the Private Investors Podcast, hosted by Maynard Payton and Roland Head, and the Value Trap Podcast, hosted by Mark Simpson and Bruce Packard. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.